So I've already done a lot of the basics and made our tools and kind of decided that I wanted to use this village, which is pretty close to spawn, as our base of operations. I also kind of know that I want to build at the island across from this river. So for now, we're just going to grab some food, a door, and a bed to make sure that we stay safe, and we're going to go on a little bit of an adventure. I'm always really surprised by how many villages spawn in plains, like, they're super, super easy to find. When I first started playing Minecraft, I always felt like I could never find a village, and now there's at least three all around at all times. So anyways, we headed over that mountain, and there's this beautiful ocean beneath us. Unfortunately, there's no coral reef, so I can't get anything to decorate our ponds yet. But, I was able to grab some more wood. And it had some exposed coal, which is what I was really looking for. I spotted a shipwreck in the distance and made a boat for us to go check it out. It had some pretty good loot. Honestly, I really, really love this seed, because not too far from spawn you get oak, birch, dark oak, spruce, and a swamp biome even. I spent a lot of time gathering more wood, especially spruce, because I know that I use that to build a lot. At this point, our inventory was pretty full, so we went back to the village and put it in storage, and now we're heading out the next morning to hopefully find a cavern. When I first started playing on this version, I kind of felt like the land generation was really extreme and it was hard for me to get used to, but at this point, I kind of really like it. It's a lot more variety and the landscapes are a lot more interesting, and it's not that hard to clear out some spaces if you end up liking the flatland more. So I ended up spending hours in this cavern mining, finding all sorts of goodies. A bit further down, I was working on a small base when I noticed that there was an unusual amount of zombies. Just gonna fill this in so we don't accidentally fall down it later. And we found a spawner. This will be awesome for making an XP farm later. I know skeletons are usually preferred, but zombie works just as well. I think spider is the only one that's not the best to do that with because the spiders keep falling up the walls. Now, sadly, for as much time as we end up spending down here, that is really the only diamond that we find, and there's only one in this little section here, too, so we'll definitely need to go searching for diamonds later, because I don't think we find any in this episode after this.
Now I've seen a whole bunch of slimes in super flat worlds for creative before, but this is my first time actually seeing one in like a survival world. My axe did break while I was fighting them, but thankfully I still had my pickaxe. Finally, we found one of the biggest things we were looking for down here, which was a geode. I know a lot of you got mad at me last time because I kept mining the budding amethyst, like the blocks that they grow off of. Um, I'm gonna be real, I'm probably never gonna pay enough attention to not grab those because I just kind of want the blocks to build with, but I do get the wisdom in leaving them there so it can regenerate. Anyways, I grabbed a whole bunch and dropped it off in our storage, uh, when I kind of made a huge mistake leaving this little base. Now I saw him, right, and looked away immediately, because that's what you're supposed to do, but unfortunately, um, I guess I spooked him. And, uh, yeah, I panicked. I did have full iron armor at this point, but I wasn't, like, emotionally ready to fight an enderman. It took me a long time to figure out how to get out of this situation. I was just kind of panic running, uh, dumping our stuff, which we don't really need to do because I, I play with keep inventory. I'm not- I'm a too big of a sore loser to not do that. But I wanted to make sure our respawn point was set, um, try to heal myself. It took me a long time to figure out that he couldn't actually get me in here. I think the roof was just too low. So I finally did figure it out, made an axe, took him down, which hurts my heart, just like killing dragons in Skyrim hurts my heart. But we did get an ender portal out of that. So at this point, the biggest thing we needed to find was acacia wood, because I wanted that for the flooring. Fun fact, the acacia wood is actually the number one reason that I started using resource packs in general, specifically Mizuno's, because the gray is just really, really beautiful. Now, unfortunately, the nearest savanna was 2,000 blocks away, so this is going to be a bit of a journey. Now, in true uh, me fashion, I got distracted. This nether portal had all of the obsidian necessary in the chest to complete it, so Obviously, we had to go into the nether now. The biggest thing I was looking for at this point was quartz, but I was kind of hoping we'd spawn in like one of the nice forests. We don't. Yeah, we got the soul sand biome, which I forgot you move really slow in, so that was kind of scary because there were some gas around, but we did grab some quartz and there were some fossils nearby, so I was able to get a lot of bone from that. If anyone can tell me how to set up, like, one of those nether hubs or nether highways, I'm sure there's plenty of tutorials on it, um, that'd be great because that's probably super useful. I'm honestly not super scared of the nether, I actually think it's really really pretty with Mizunos. But anyway, so we headed back out. And we're actually pretty close to the savannah here, there have been quite a few villages on the way, um, but this one had some really funky terrain gen. I did bring a saddle with us, so we're going to be grabbing a horse soon so we can make the journey back faster. But there's really nothing of note in these villages. I do end up grabbing the brewing stand from the cleric because uh, I wanted to use that in our base. I watched a whole bunch of videos to research how to do different things in the game because honestly, uh, like I had mentioned, I've never really enchanted or brewed um, or done anything with villagers and I'm hoping to in this series. So the idea of like villager breeding or uh, let's grab this advancement real quick. 
but villager breeding or trading and anything like that is still a little foggy for me, but we're definitely going to be doing stuff with that later on. Let's see. Be my friend. Be my friend. Be my friend. 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 Okay. What should we name her? I think our other horse in the 1.17 is Meadow, so I want to do something different from that. I swear, man, Plains has all of the loot. This chest had not one, but two tools with silk touch. That was like my wish list enchantment. Finally, time to refocus on our task. We grabbed a couple of stacks of acacia logs and quite a few saplings. a different path back than we took there and ended up finding this really cute like flower forest island which was great because I wanted alliums and I'm pretty sure they only grow here. What are your guys' favorite flowers in game? I go back and forth between the blue orchids and tulips a lot. I also use our silk touch to grab these bees nest. I think I got about three of them in total. I know I'm going to be wanting making a lot of candles, so I definitely need the beeswax, I think. And I think that's about it. Maybe a couple more. So we made it back home and I dumped our stuff in storage but there's just a few more things we needed to grab from the lush caves if we can find one. Now, I know what you're thinking. What happened to all of your levels? Um, I was out trying to kill skeletons and I ended up finding the zombie villager, which I thought would be really cool if we could like, you know, cure him. So I just, I guess, forgot all those skeletons were there and tried to dig a hole to put him in. And yeah, I, I was... I was shot. Anyways, we did end up finding an azalea tree, so we dug our way down. I figured I would use this entrance a lot, so I was making more of like a staircase. Honestly, I don't know why I didn't just dig the three blocks out this first time instead of having to go back and do it, because nobody likes jumping back up from the two. But... This was faster. I kind of wish I had grabbed some of these clay blocks while I was down here too, but I honestly didn't know what they were um, from just looking at them. Ooh, I hear babies. Where are they? Where are they? Let's see, I might throw out all of our resources and make a whole bunch of buckets, just to grab a whole bunch of them. There they are. Well, we ended up grabbing three of them. There was a yellow, a white, and or maybe a blue, and a pink one. And now we're gonna head our way back out. So our goal for this episode is to get our starter house built and plan out some of the layout for the first village. 
Firstly, though, I want to build a bridge so it's a little bit easier for me to transport materials from this house where we kind of store everything over to the island where we're going to be building. So we've gotten the main structure built and right now I'm going to plant a whole bunch of trees so we can harvest the leaves and use them for decoration. I think it's really cool how one moss block can turn into so much floral like overgrowth and really decorate an area pretty quickly. I use a lot of this to kind of decorate the shores just to add some variation and interesting things to look at. I didn't want to go too crazy on this arch, but I do use both acacia, flowering acacia, and oak leaves just to kind of give a little bit of variety and make it really pretty to look at. I realized I'd been talking about this island a lot, but never actually gave you guys a good visual, so this is where we're going to be building. I plan to mostly keep the buildings to the part that's already been cleared out and a little bit across the river. I think it would look really cool to have a village that's built over like a bridge system. So I was just about to start planning our layout when I saw a couple of wolves and decided that we needed to get ourselves a couple dogs. Here's our horse by the way, for now I will be building her a nice stable attached to our house a little bit later and we'll be naming her at the end of this episode. So I already tamed one of the wolves and the second one was over here earlier. There he is. Cute, they're twins. Okay, so we're back on track and I've been working on terraforming. Um, I really want to add a lot of different levels to this area so it looks really nice and kind of really supports the landscape of our village. So from up here, you can kind of see what I've been thinking. That's pretty much the layout that I want to go with, trying to give it nice sort of curves around the edge and make it kind of a funky shape. I do plan on adding quite a few levels here. Over on this side, I've been working out on planning out our pathway and then the area underneath the oak tree. I'm probably going to do either a community park or possibly farms. Then the other cleared out space will end up being like a large enchanting area. And yeah, so I've been working on our pathway in the same style as the bridge. This village palette is gonna end up using a lot of stone, deep slate, and acacia materials. The wall design, by the way, isn't super functional. Uh, because of the full blocks, you can kind of just jump straight over it. So I'm assuming mobs can as well, but I just really love how it looks. So I'm using a mix of deep slate, cobble deep slate, and deep slate bricks. I'll also be adding in some deep slate stairs to kind of add some texture to the pathways. So let's take a look at what we've done so far. I also use slabs to kind of create a gentle slope going up and down the different heights of the path. So I built a lot of the pathway and I 
didn't mean to let this moss grow here. Typically, I like to add in a lot of greenery to our paths or kind of stick to more of the grass paths themselves, but I want this one to feel a bit more structured than usual, so I'm not going to let too much of this kind of poke through. So here's that hill's progress so far. I think it's at about four levels right now. I'll probably add at least one more, and I also raised some of the areas over to the left. I want to have kind of like a gentle sloping area with multiple levels. I also planned out a little bit more of our pathway around this hill. Eventually, I do plan on adding like a huge bridge over here to the other shore and a big castle on this large hill itself, so that'll kind of act as like the main entryway to the keep. Over here, I also put in a small pond. I plan to add these kind of around our walls to add the sort of natural elements back in that I know that we like to have for fairy gore. Over here, I made this small garden area. I did originally have it mixed with a whole bunch of different kinds of flowers, but having them all in a row like this with the same ones made my brain happier. So that's what we're going with for this one. Like I mentioned over here, I plan on doing a small community park or maybe even a farm. I'm probably going to leave that tree here because I like the larger oak trees and I might add one of our bees nests to it. And yeah, that's our planning in progress so far. Um, after this, it's actually time to start building. So for the house, I wanted a medieval but fairy core feel with a really amethyst focused palette. And with that being said, let's get into our build time lapse. And yeah, that's our house, guys. I really love this style of build. It's heavily inspired by Blue Nerd Minecraft, and I can't wait to see, you know, like the whole village kind of come together with this. Here's what we have for the inside so far. I do have all of these spaces like completely planned out in a creative world. So in the next episode, we'll actually be focused on finishing the interior and probably venturing back into the nether because I want to put like a brewing area. So we'll need to go get some blaze rods. And yeah, that's pretty much it, but I do want to name our horse before we go. Let's grab these. Uh-oh, added too many leaves here. So 
So I asked you guys to leave suggestions on the first episode about what we should name her, and we ended up getting Estella, which I think is really beautiful. I really love some of the views of this place. I think it came together really beautifully. And there we go, our Estella. Now, today's goal is to finish the interior of the house, and to do that, we need to get more diamonds. I plan to eventually build a proper mine entrance in this cavern with pathways and cranes and minecart systems, but for now, we have a waterfall. It took me a while, but I was eventually able to find an ore. Unfortunately, like last time, there was only one in the spot and I had spent about an hour searching so this left me feeling a bit defeated. With such a sad haul, I decided to head back up and work on our next part of our plan, which is to start building a sugarcane farm. Well, I guess less of a farm and more just plant a bunch of sugarcane for now. I know it isn't necessary, but I prefer how it looks on sand, so I went to the opposite shore and started digging a bunch up when I found this chest. This was a pretty awesome score, and with the diamonds that we found here, we should now be able to build our enchanting table and a diamond pickaxe. I'm not sure where I want a sugarcane farm like long term. When I build an actual automated one, it'll probably be inside of a building. But for now, I picked an area on our island next to the water. I don't know if this will eventually be the permanent spot for them, but it's relatively close to base and immediately out of sight. I spent a lot of the next morning building and decorating the inside of our house. I really wanted to bring more greenery inside than just leaves, and the stairwell made a perfect indoor garden. These purple flowers are actually alliums turned into lavender with a resource pack, and I think it's my favorite thing right now. Now back here is where we're going to start brewing our potions. I already have the potion stand itself, but before we can start actually making them, we will need to take one more trip to the nether. That afternoon I went to the village to loot a couple of supplies, including these bookshelves. I do have some tools with silk touch, but I didn't want to use them here since all I really need to put these back together is a few planks. 
I'm always so scared I'm gonna accidentally hit a villager whenever I come here to gather supplies. Although we have just fed everything we need to brew, it was time to take our trip to the nether. I made our diamond pick so we could grab any extra obsidian while we were at the portal, and then put the rest of our diamonds away for safekeeping. It took me quite a while to find the portal, but I eventually got there and grabbed our extra obsidian. So the first thing I did when I got over here was build a small shelter around our portal to keep safe and store some of our extra stuff. Now we're looking for a fortress to gather some nether wart and blaze rods, and I believe there's one far in this direction. I know in a previous video I mentioned I wasn't afraid of the nether, but this venture really put that to the test. I realized while recording this that I had actually always explored the nether with somebody, so Doing it on my own was pretty nerve-wracking. Well, I don't like those noises. Thankfully, the blaze spawner was really close to where I had dropped on the fortress. My main strategy for dealing with this place was to barricade myself and secure certain sections to fight from a distance. This worked really well and I ended up staying for about an hour or so and got somewhere around 20 rods. After that, I found the nether wart we needed, looted a few chests, and headed back to the overworld. The next thing we needed to do was get the rest of our obsidian for our enchanting table. This ended up taking way less water than I thought it would.
I lost the last one to lava, but that's okay, because I had way more than I actually needed. I went to feed our two cows, Bessie and Moo, and then went to go grab a few more to make a little more secure food supply. Everyone meet Eric, Bowman, and Sherb, I guess. Today's goal is to build a few automated farms so we can get some much needed resources. But first, I'm gonna head to the jungle to grab some bamboo, cocoa beans, and jungle saplings. The jungle was a decent ways away, and it took me almost a full day to get there. Unfortunately, I don't know if it's the distance that we traveled or maybe my mods conflicting, but my computer was really unhappy over here and I ended up with a whole lot of lag. So we don't get much footage from the jungle. When we got back, I decided to check out our mines, uh, specifically that area that we had blocked off before next to our spawner. I really wanted to find iron and redstone while we were down here, but we get quite a lot of good stuff. I think in the next episode we'll make our mob XP farm. As I was heading down, I found a friend. What you're about to see here is what we like to call a pro gamer move. For some reason, I thought if I put the water down it would like wash the creeper away. So imagine my surprise when I turned around and he was right behind me. This hole eventually led to an open cave where I was able to grab some of our much needed cobwebs from a mine shaft. I was hoping to find a cave spider spawner, but we didn't get that lucky this time. We did, however, find some diamonds. After I was happy with the amount of resources we found, I went back to the surface to begin building our farms. I don't like to automate everything, I feel like that's a great way, at least for me, to get bored of the game pretty fast. However, we will be building a cow, chicken, and sugarcane or bamboo farm. This is the cow farm, I've built it before in our 1.17 Let's Play, and I'll have the tutorials I followed for each of these linked down below.
I've been thinking about how I wanted this village to be laid out and I think this area over here next to our house is going to be like the richer people houses if that makes sense, the bigger and fancier ones. The village itself across the way, I'm definitely going to keep the village but just upgrade the houses and over here for these farms is going to be a big like market or commerce district. I've built them all really close together because they'll all be on the inside of one large workshop building. I also decided to put them all over here and make this the commerce district because some of these farms can be really noisy and I didn't really want that going next to us if we were peacefully doing something inside of the house. And here's our workshop. On this side, we have a small patio area where you could like rest or eat your food or something. In the back, there's a chimney with a furnace, a secondary entrance, and I moved the workstation that was previously on the patio behind our house back over here. It's just a grindstone stone cutter and anvil but I felt like it fit here better. Just on the outside, I have some hay bales and a barrel here, just for a little bit of storage. And over here is a small farm where I'm growing the wheat. I mix some potatoes in because I like mixing crops, but it's really just for the wheat to breed the cows. So for this farm, basically you breed your cows up here, Make sure to push the button to push out the water. Um, it makes it a little bit easier to read them and it makes sure that the lava doesn't, you know, cook these ones. But once you've bred them, the babies will drop down into this chamber where the lava can't touch them because they're too short. But when you flip this lever, the lava comes out. The lava comes out, it'll cook the adults and we'll get our steak and leather. For the chicken farm, when the adults lay the eggs, they're shot out into the other chamber. This sometimes gives you a chick. Again, when they grow up, the lava will cook them and we will get chicken and feathers. Finally, with this farm, when a plant grows high enough that the observer kind of triggers, it'll shoot out the pistons, which will cut them down and they drop them down into these minecart hoppers, which then drops them into these chests. I also added this tower back here for some extra storage just in case the chests fill up too fast. Today's goal is to get our armor ready to face the dragon. This being get enough diamonds to actually make the armor and then enough levels and bookshelves to actually enchant it. I started out by heading over to our auto farms to collect some things and feed our cows. I did end up adding a few things to the building, like over here I added a small storage area, as well as some decorations. Don't worry, we're just um, sending them to the great farm in the sky. Anyways, I'm getting ready for a small journey, so I decided to grab some food, a crafting table, and sugar cane, just so we can have our paper prepared when we're ready to make our bookshelves. Another thing I added was an overhang here and moss carpet so our dogs have a cozy place to hang out. Speaking of which, it's about time we named them. A few episodes ago, we got the suggestion, and I think these are very cute names, so we're going with it. Okay. 
everyone, meet Lily and Luna. The next morning, I was heading over to our mines when I got assaulted by a few mobs. Honestly, combat is not my strong suit in this game, but I think we did okay. Anyways, my goal this trip into the mines is to get as deep as possible and try moss mining for diamonds. Like usual, I head down our waterfall and then I take to that area where we had covered up before to get back down to that open cave mine. From here, I found another cavern and went as deep as that could take me. I eventually found my way into a very deep cave, but there were a lot of mobs waiting for me. I played a very delicate game here of dancing around them while trying to mine and manage their numbers. We don't end up dying, but it was probably my most stressful time playing Minecraft. Despite the danger, I found quite a few diamonds while I was down here, and once I had enough, I went back home and began building our diamond arsenal. Thank you. 
With our diamond pieces crafted, I switched my focus to exploring and chopping trees. I was also trying to find a horse on this trip, but I didn't see any that I thought were very cute. After a while, I did run into a pillager outpost, and while I felt brave at first, I got scared and decided to save it for another episode. that our bookshelves are in place and our enchanting area is finished, we have one more thing to do before we can actually begin enchanting. We need to build an XP farm. Thankfully, we've already found a mob spawner in one of our earlier episodes.
I'll have a link to the tutorial that I followed for this down below, but basically, it's pretty much just a big old kill chamber that pushes the zombies down with a waterfall sort of system onto a campfire. You can leave it there and just AFK if you just want the drops, but if you hit them, you also get XP. It's kind of a slow process, but it's definitely effective. I spent a while going back and forth between the enchanting table, occasionally spending levels on dummy enchants, and then back at the XP farm, till I had a set that I was happy with. It's not perfect, but by the end I had a diamond pickaxe with silk touch and efficiency, an efficiency, fortune, and unbreaking, and sharpness axe, unbreaking, flame, and infinity bow, and an unbreaking and protection chest and leggings. Today's goal is going to be to set up a villager trading hall, but we do take a few detours along the way. One of the materials I was going to need for this build was a honey block, so I decided this would be the perfect time to set up those beehives we got pretty early on. While I was working on this small little like bee garden, it really started to give me Aubrette vibes. That was my first village I had made and like the first thing that I really made that I like loved in Minecraft. It was very fairy core and I miss it. And here's our finished garden. I don't need a lot of honey, so this is perfect and I think super cozy.
While we wait for our bees to make more honey, let's meet the newest addition to our family. Everyone, this is Cookie, and she is such a cutie. I don't know what it is, but I've been super obsessed with these, like, light brown horses lately. Uh, I think they just give me very strong fall vibes. Anyways, I put Cookie with her other horse, Estella, for now and went off to accomplish my next task. A creeper had ruined our front porch a couple of days ago, and I'm pretty tired of them being so close to our base, so it's finally time to get a few cats. Anyways, with these things out of the way, I started to work on our villager setup, starting with a breeder. As always, I'll have the tutorials that I followed for these kinds of things linked in the description down below. I will say that the breeder was giving me a lot of trouble. The minecarts kept refusing to launch, and I have yet to find a fix for this. Also, please ignore my skin. Uh, my computer was having a fit that day. But the basics of the system, villagers are fed at the top, they make the babies, and eventually the babies grow up to be pushed out on minecarts. Then the villagers are pushed along the tracks to Kevin. Kevin unalives a villager, and we get to play Witch Doctor.
Eventually through this process, we'll get very discounted prices on their trades. This is my first time actually trading with villagers, so I had a lot of fun making this. Obviously, amending villager was one of my main goals, and it took many, 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 many rerolls to get one. We were eventually lucky enough to get one and a lot of other really useful master level villagers. With the books we bought from our librarian, I was finally able to give our tools mending, taking us one step closer to defeating the dragon. Today's goal is to create a large, cozy farm slash garden area on the edge of our main island. In my test world for this series, I did play with the idea of making this whole area just a really big wheat field. I obviously thought that was super pretty, but then I remembered that fairy core farm I built a while back and wanted to mix some of the elements from that with this build.
I was pretty quickly running out of spruce items, so we took a quick trip to gather some more.
For the rest of the levels, I put fences inside from the logs, but this time I thought it'd be really cool if I put them on top for a little bit of variation. I saw this grapevine idea forever ago on Pinterest and I really, really love adding it to my farm builds now.
Originally, I was going to add some more crops over here, but a small storage cabin would be really cute too.
I played with the idea of adding a castle tower to the entryway, but decided on something simpler. The final thing I did was expand our city walls and connect them to the garden. This whole build took me about a day to complete and it's so cozy. Before we get to the good part, I needed to run to the sea for some kelp, and then into the nether for some glowstone. This series is my first time really using enchanted gear. Most of my Minecraft time before was spent in creative, just building things. It's crazy to me how much more effective things get with them. With those errands done, it was time to start building. Today's goal was to build a small underground storage room. I say small, but the great thing about underground builds is you can expand them as much as you want. For this one, I'm just starting out with two main rooms. You might be wondering why this episode looks a bit different than my other ones. I finally made the switch from BSL to complementary shaders, and I am loving it so far. I think my favorite change is the color reactive lights. You'll see it a bit later when we go from like torches to lanterns, but it's a really neat effect. Let me know what you guys think about the switch and which one you prefer in the comments below. took me a long time to figure out how I wanted to blend the wall in with the actual front of the build, but I think it came together pretty good.
I use a lot of andesite and stone brick materials, but we will be adding a dripstone accent wall as well. I don't remember the actual technical name of it, but like I said, the color shifting lights are my favorite part of this shader. It adds a really subtle but immersive feel. I will say though, it can take a bit to get used to during actual gameplay. When I planned this build, it was actually one block lower, so I ended up having to add another layer to cover these exposed roof bits.
Over here is just another storage room, but I knew I was gonna keep my iron and ores in here, so I added this semi-auto smelter in this little nook. I saw this waterway idea in Forge Labs' dungeon in their Medieval Times episode, and I knew I needed to add it here. Like I said, I am fairly new to these shaders, so you might find me switching graphics up mid-episode just to find what looks a little bit better. One thing I thought might be really cool would be to connect this build to our mob farm for quicker access. And to do that, we're going to start with a couple water elevators.
with the elevators in place, it was time to work on the tunnel. I wanted a quick back and forth trip that wouldn't require me sprinting the whole way, so I added in some mine tracks. Conveniently, this tunnel actually passes through a geode, which will be great for farming amethyst for our roofs. I may have lost a minecart or two testing out our tracks, but with that in place, it's time to check out what we've built. In this room, we have our main building materials and decorations. This section here is more for decoration, but I do plan to move our actual dragon fighting gear in this room instead. Over here, like I said, are our smeltables and miscellaneous goods. And of course, our mine access. <laughs> Thank you. 
You can make this faster if you want with more powered rails. Today, we're actually doing another first for me, raiding a woodland mansion. I spotted one while I was exploring a few days ago and decided to save it for a video of its own, so here we are. Before heading out, I decided to level up to our enchanted diamond gear, just in case the place had some pretty heavy hitters. Which, spoiler, it did. With our gear good to go, I made way for our conquest. I rode nearly until dawn before I spotted it just beyond the trees. I did wait until morning before approaching its walls, and when I first came upon the entrance, I saw that there was this river leading into it, which I originally thought was kind of inconvenient, but it actually comes in super handy later. A base of operations was my first goal, so if things got a little too dicey, I had a quick escape and also somewhere to store all of my junk I don't really want to take home with me. Once that was done, I was ready to embark on my first real dungeon crawl. To those of you who are new to this like I am, woodland mansions are massive structures teeming with dangerous foes, magical creatures, and forces of terrible dark power. Let's see what this one has in store for us. I started out very cautious, lighting up anywhere that looked even slightly dark. A lot of the rooms I encountered didn't really have much in them, so you might notice me taking blocks out of a lot of the walls. I was convinced that there was supposed to be a hidden treasure somewhere. My first real opposition came not from something new, and not just one, but three of my greatest foes in this game. Creepers. Thankfully, shields are extremely effective against their blasts, this hidden staircase a little bit less so. Once I had climbed my way back up, I did find a chest in the wall with some decent loot.
My next interesting find was a bunch of imprisoned delays, but I wasn't really sure what to do with them, so I left them there for the time being. I was working on making a smooth passage back out of the building for emergencies when I encountered a real threat. Truth be told, combat isn't my strong suit in any game but Skyrim, so this guy really freaked me out. Once I gained a bit of confidence about my ability to handle the mobs, a new fear arose. Getting lost. This was easy to fix by taking out a few carpets here and there to mark a path back to the exit. And with that, the first section was cleared. After a brief rest and unloading at the base, I went to the other direction from the stairs. Now remember kids, caution over confidence. I was getting a bit cocky here and didn't really pay attention to the fact that I was about to be ambushed. However, this is when that river proved its usefulness. This chest was really the only thing I found over here, and with that, it was time to head upstairs. Ah. <laughs> 
I went right first this time, almost immediately facing a few Vindicators, which was bad enough before an Evoker noticed me. I had no idea these little demons existed, and I did not appreciate dealing with them. I did a bit of research on how to handle this situation during my panic pause, and all sources recommended waiting it out until they despawned. So naturally I rushed in and fought the evoker in melee combat. Eventually the situation was handled, and I got my first totem of undying. I really thought there was supposed to be hidden treasure in the wall, so I tried checking the top. This gave me the brilliant idea to sneak past the rest of the mobs to search the rooms. This didn't really work out as planned. And this time my Russian approach was, shockingly, ineffective. So I snuck around the back until I could take him down with my bow. And that was my trip. I did a bit more searching, but I wasn't really able to find anything else of note. All in all, we left with a few heads, name tags, CDs, tokens, and a lead. Today, we're building a magical fairy pond and axolotl sanctuary. We're gonna start out by making the pathway. As usual, this begins with me kind of sketching out the basic idea for the layout with a shovel. Then I go back in and add in the actual materials that I'll be using. For this pathway, we're gonna be using coarse dirt and rooted dirt. I really wanted this pathway to feel kind of like a hidden magical forest area, so to create a sort of boxed in effect, I'm going to really thicken the tree line and cover up any other open spaces with leafy bushes. I'm also gonna make a canopy with flowering azalea leaves.
Once the main structural parts were done, I went through with bone meal and just kind of built up the flora around the area. I didn't want it to feel too overwhelming, but the overgrown look definitely adds to the magical effect. These spore blossoms really, really added to the ambiance. I absolutely love the little particles that they drop. I wanted to keep it simple with the lighting so I didn't add any sort of like glow stones into the pathway. So I went with my other favorite thing which is lanterns on tree stumps. I saw this like dark oak tree stump idea on Pinterest and thought it would be the perfect decoration for this area. I dug out a small hole, filled it with some podzol, and now I'm going to build up the actual stump with dark oak wood. And then we're going to decorate around it with mushrooms and moss. And here's the final entryway. I'm completely in love with how it turned out. I had already cleared out a whole bunch of trees so I'd have a nice area to work with. And so we're starting out again by sketching out a path and kind of figuring out how we want to use the landscape. Once the path was done, I used cobblestone to sketch out the ponds. I tried to follow the actual flow of the landscape as much as possible to create something that still looks and feels somewhat natural. After that, I moved on to fencing in the pathway and added in some leaves about the area. The decoration for this whole build really happens in waves. I like to focus on the big stuff first and try to work my way smaller so I have fun with the process without feeling overwhelmed. I used spruce for the fences because I wanted it to kind of match the fairy core farm we had built over on the other side of the island. But if that wasn't a consideration, I probably would have gone with oak. I think the lighter wood would have really complemented the area well.
Once I finished the pathing around the place, I wanted to focus on decorating the bottom of the ponds. Everything was going pretty smoothly until I headed back into town for some more resources and ran into my greatest foe in this game. A creeper. He honestly blended in with the surroundings really well and I almost didn't notice him in time, but I did thankfully get him away from our path so at the very least he didn't destroy what we build. And I moved our cat charcoal in here to hopefully keep them away. I wanted the ponds here to kind of match the natural rivers and landscape generation of the game, so we'll be mixing in some moss, sand, gravel, and clay. Once I was happy with how the ponds were looking, I moved on to making a small cave area so the oxalotls have a safe place to hide and relax. I chose to light the area up at night so I could see where it really needed it. Honestly, this was a little bit stressful because I was really worried another mob or creeper would pop out of nowhere and end up destroying something that we made. Thankfully, this didn't happen. With the lights in place and a lot of the major decorating done, it was time to fill the ponds. We're already on an island, so finding water wasn't difficult, but this is one of my least favorite things to work with in-game. Oh. 
I'm not really a huge fan of how the water flows over different areas, and it took a long time. In fact, I think it probably took me longer to fill the ponds than it did to build this whole area. But once it was done, I was very happy with the outcome. We're basically done now, so I went back and grabbed the axolotls from storage and brought them to their new home. As I was going along, I did add in some stone buttons and moss carpeting just to finish up the pathway. At first I wasn't sure if they would just wander off, so I only added a few to different areas at a time. Thankfully, they seem to stay put, and they seem to really love their new home. Today, we're going after the Ender Dragon. Now, in truth, she and I are not enemies, and I have no real reason to attack her specifically, but it's a necessary evil to claim my real prize, an Elytra. Thankfully, the stronghold wasn't that far from our home, but it was at the bottom of a ravine. My gear was enchanted with Aquafinity and Respiration, so getting down here wasn't too difficult. I got inside in the perfect room because I was safe from any immediate attacks. There were a couple zombies and a creeper, but they weren't too difficult to deal with behind the wall. I end up using this room as my treasure room to store things when my inventory gets too full. These little guys definitely shocked me. I'd heard about silverfish before, but I'd never actually encountered one, let alone three.
This was a decent sized dungeon, but honestly the loot wasn't anything amazing. The bookshelves are probably the best find, and there were a few enchanted diamond pieces. I continued exploring a bit after I found the portal room and took out a few more mobs, but my main goal was just to make sure that I had thoroughly lit the place as I went. Once I was satisfied exploring, I opened the portal and began my first ever attempt at defeating the Ender Dragon. I was blown away at how stunning the end is with this shader. Thankfully, we came through the portal in an underground pit on the main island, so it started me off in a good position. Some of you are probably going to ask yourself why I'm going after these crystals in such an unsafe way, and the answer is simple. I have terrible aim with the bow. I can't hit them from the ground, so I use scaffolding to climb up and water towers to get back down safely when I could. I did get knocked down a couple of times, but feather falling saved the day, and after a while I got into the swing of things and managed to take out all of the crystals. It admittedly took me a while to realize arrows don't do anything if she's sitting on that pedestal. I also had a hard time actually getting the breath in the bottles, I think I was just panicking a bit. At some point, I aggroed an enderman, and I tried to bucket my way to safety, but I didn't move around enough, and the dragon hit me with her breath. I got a bit frustrated after that death, so I spent some time working at our base, and eventually came back to finish the fight. And at last, we vanquished our foe and secured ourselves a dragon egg.
wonder what that was about. Anyways, I found our end portal and proceeded to search for an end city with a ship. Some of you might be unhappy with my decision here, but I really only came for an elytra, so I'm ignoring the city and going straight up to the ship. Yeah, that levitation effect is no joke, but I brought chorus fruit, so we ended up okay. I managed to make it up and inside fast enough that we could safely kill the shulkers. and we finally secured our prize. I really wanted to start working on larger builds around the village, so I'm hoping that being able to fly will make that a little bit easier. I made sure to loot the chests up here, make a shulker box, and grab the potions in the brewing stand. With that, I headed back home to put mending on our dragon wings. It's definitely something to get the hang of. I almost crashed into things several times, but I am enjoying our new Elytra. I moved our workshop to this side of the island using World Edit. I want the overall build to have a very cozy, almost cramped feel, and this being closer to the larger items makes more sense for that. I also added a water wheel to the back of our original storage hut, and after that, I walled in the cliff areas. More details will be added to the walls later, but I wanted to get a basic feel for how it's going to look. I added a little waterfall here just for some more natural elements on this part of the island. And the next big change is I added pavement and outlines for the Commerce District, which we'll be building after this episode. I'm thinking I'll put a park bench over here, just to have a kind of like seating area for anyone who happens to be traveling through. We have some basic pathing going around, and then an outline for another large player house. Oh, 
Up here will eventually be the keep and the courtyard. Those will be the last things that we build in this world, but we have a few more areas to get to first. Now, for today's work, we're building the Lower District, which is where I'll be upgrading this village across the river. I'm gonna do some light terraforming and I'll see you after. Once I had some levels going, I laid out a pathway and got to work figuring out our buildings. I wanted to stay true to the spirit of the original village, so I counted out how many houses, jobs, and decorations there were, so I could roughly stick to that. I was thinking about six smallish designs and three larger constructs. As I'm doing this, I also try to make sure I'm varying shapes and generally sticking to odd numbers for the wall lengths. This makes the roofs a lot easier to put together. I also made a point to leave an extra space where the wall would be put between the buildings and the dirt. I've made a few villages before and I always feel like they're too spaced out, so this time I made everything really close together. Hopefully the outcome looks nicer and a little bit more realistic. My tools were looking a little bit rough, so I took a break from our planning to farm some XP.
It stormed to the night, which meant the next morning we were greeted with this really beautiful rainbow. With our tools repaired, I got to work on the walls. It's easy to lose motivation on larger projects like this, so I highly recommend getting your framing done first. The sooner you see the vision coming to life, the more likely you are to complete it. Now I had planned to show you guys these being built with the replay mod, but the file got corrupted, so you'll be following real time. This might be helpful for anyone trying to replicate these builds or a similar style. I tend to start out with the wood frame and stone base. This helps me understand the shape of the building a little bit better as we're going along. Normally I plan my builds in a super flat world, but for this project, I tried to figure it out as I was working. This is a bit more tedious in survival, but really rewarding when I was finished. I decided to vary the ratio of blocks on the roofs to simulate the economic difference between the different sides of the river. So this side gets a lot more wool and netherag and a little bit less amethyst.
I use basically the same roof shape everywhere and yet I mess it up almost every time after this. All the builds have a very similar base, but for the second house, I made the foundation one block taller. Making the wall first turned out to be super helpful when working on these buildings.
Once I finished this house, I built a few smaller ones and then moved on to a different shape building. I wanted a round sort of feel for this tower and based it off of the one connected to our player house. Honestly, I have yet to design a tower roof that I'm fully happy with. This one feels a little too boxy. Anyways, I kept the interiors rather simple, I was mostly focused on making sure I had enough beds. And let's take a look at some of our finished structures. This one's super simple. Over here we've got a librarian's house. And in our first one, just a bed with some small decorations. I moved on to the second level next where we have another librarian and the cartographer. If I were to go back and redo this build, I would probably make it a lot taller to add more levels to the village overall. I also struggled a bit with the interior on this one. I wanted something cozy without being claustrophobic. In the end, I think it came out really nice.
I moved the town squared items over here as well, but I replaced the yellow wool with purple. I'm going to build these last two here, and I will see you after for the tour. Alrighty guys, let's take a look at our upgraded village. I added an extra bed in here, but it's still about the same. We have this tower here, which serves as kind of a lookout point. This one is probably my favorite in terms of interiors. I think it's important to add small areas around your buildings to make the whole thing feel lived in. This is connected up here, but I'm not really sure what to do with this building yet or the space beneath it. Over here we have a simple stone cutter job block and a bedroom. And I created this dock area to finish off the lower level. I was going to add another building here, but for now it's just a tree park. I kept this area separate in case Kevin ever gets out, but he really shouldn't. Once again, this is a librarian and cartographer building. And yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm gonna go up to this perch so we can get a top-down view of everything that's been built from our old stuff to the new village. There's still some more basic decorating to do, and it could easily be expanded, but I think this is a really good start. 
The area behind and around it I'll probably turn into large crop fields with a few buildings here and there. There have been a lot of changes in this world since we were last here. I'm going to be walking you through it later and I also did a cozy just no voice walkthrough video earlier so you've already gotten a chance to look at it. So for now we'll take this peek and then we'll come back to it at the end of the video. I added this pathway here which connects to our main pathway and kind of goes around the yard of this what was originally going to be house but I'm thinking it'd be really cute if we made this a sort of museum with different exhibits based around what we did in each episode of the series. And up here we have where we're going to be building our keep. I already made a layout with wool, so we'll be filling that in with stone bricks soon. But first, let's get a look at what the current plan is. A quick look over at our village and this beautiful field that took a long time to plant. Over there we've got a small little caravan area, but we'll be taking a closer look at that later on. So for the layout, I've always been a huge fan of the corner towers with some sort of main central structure for castles. This one is definitely built with that in mind. I wanted something a little grander than I normally build, but still within my scope of coziness. Okay, I can't help it. Look at this really cute pond. Back here, I did add an underground entrance to the castle. That leads over to our underground storage area. And this will come out somewhere in a courtyard, I'm thinking. But let's get to filling this outline in. Once I got the basic shape filled in, it was time to figure out my levels. I knew I wanted the center part to be one of the highest areas, at least of the main buildings and not the towers. I'm thinking somewhere between three to five layers of the stone brick foundation. I did run out of stone bricks, so we're going to run back to the workshop, grab our stone cutter, and bring it back to where we're working. I'm honestly so proud of this village. This area came together so beautifully. I think it's definitely the best village that I've made so far. My 1.171 with a very similar color scheme was a little bit too spread out. I didn't have enough decorations everywhere. And my first fairy core village with the rounder roofs, I think was just, there's nothing really wrong with it, but it was definitely pretty small. This is when I remember that you need stone to make stone bricks and not cobblestone, so we're gonna go cook this down in the storage room. Thank you. 
I figured this mine track would be faster than running back and forth, but the system needs some work. So I added some levels to a few of the different buildings and now I'm adding in the log framing. I wanted this to have a very similar sort of feel and design to the rest of the village so it does give this sense of it all being one place built together. When I'm building these kinds of things I try to think of the flow of energy, the, the flow of history, so what would have come first? In this case, I'm thinking it may have been the village by the river and everything else just sort of got bigger and bigger around it as more people came, more commerce, and the community around the village grew. So for a few changes, I moved the entrance to the underground tunnel from this courtyard into the main building since that's just going to be the bottom story. I also built up the walls and added in a bunch of different types of stone to add some texture and variation. We're also starting to get a firmer sense of buildings here, and I'm trying to keep in mind the flow of traffic for how to get to each different part of the castle. And now it's time to add in the calcite. I'm always trying to find ways to add in variation when I'm making these sort of builds. I fail because I end up leaning on the same building and roof shape a lot. For this one, I wanted this to be one of the taller structures as far as the actual calcite part goes. I thought that I originally wanted this to have just a basic A-frame shape. And then I, I quickly realized I didn't actually like that. I ended up moving it to the same type that we have on the main player house. Now it's time to vary the texture of the buildings by using dripstone instead of calcite. If you're building on vanilla and you want to do something similar to this, I probably would not recommend dripstone. The texture looks way different in vanilla than it does in Mizuno's. But for these purposes, I think it's really pretty with the gray. For the towers, I was originally just going to leave them the flat top with the parapets, but I ended up deciding to add a building to the top. I decided to take a quick break from building because my elytra was running low and I definitely didn't want that to break which meant we'd be spending the night in our XP generator. Let's see what we have built so far. I ended up getting the building on the second story done for the main section, as well as adding in polished diorite to the calcite. And then I went off to grab some water so I could create a small infinite water source on that second story of the castle to use for a neat little detail I thought of. I thought it would look really cool if we surrounded this building in waterlogged stairs, so I'm going to make an infinite water source here and get to work filling those in. We're going to ignore the fact that I can't count.
I definitely recommend filling in every other stair because that'll fill in the ones next to it instead of every single stair. I figure that out later. Next, I added in the windows. For this, I used a lot of purple stained glass as well as light blue stained glass and cyan stained glass. I adore the window textures in Mizuno's, especially for these kinds of builds. It really has that nice medieval quality to it. Finally, it was time to get started on the roofs. As always, I'll be beginning with the actual frame of the roof in deep slate tiles. And then we'll move on to the gradients. Alrighty, we have the main roofs done, and it is now time to think about the tower tops. I've mentioned it before, but I struggle with these a lot. I'm never really happy, and usually feel like they come out way too round looking. But we'll see if I make something here that we enjoy. Another thing for my vanilla builders, netherrack has a much more red look to it than purple in vanilla, so I might switch that out for a different block if you want to do a purple gradient. I don't think I'll ever get over how pretty amethysts look and sound. And it's... it's okay. I'm not in love with it yet, but... A little more tweaking and we'll get there. And this is what we ended up with. I'm reasonably satisfied for now and ready to move on to the next part of the build. Campfires make the perfect roof for this area because it still feels open to the elements but covered and protected. And it kind of gives the idea that it's like timber framing covering the courtyard. I also just really love using campfires as roofs and flooring. Later on when I begin detailing, I'll definitely be mixing in leaves for this area so it has a lot more natural cottage y vibes. Even though I recognize this is very much not cottage core, we are in a fantasy build mode right now. I did add a stained glass roof to this building because I thought that would look really cool. You technically can get across this way, though I wouldn't count this as a official pathway.
and here's that mini walkway I was talking about before. To make this match the other pathways better, I am going to replace this line with chiseled stone blocks, but I forgot to grab them. I'm using acacia fencing so it can match with the rest of the village and stone brick walls to blend it in with the castle just a little bit better. I'm going to fence this in so it's not easy to fall from the other sides. And finally finish off that pathway. This is all of the building that I plan to do on video, but once I add in more detail and finish the castle, I will make a tour of it later on. For those of you who do want it, this world will be available once I'm done adding my final decorations, and I'll probably leave it free on my Ko-Fi for like a month, honestly, as a thank you to everyone who stuck with the series for so long. And here's our final castle. So far. I'm honestly really, really proud of myself. I don't really like doing larger things like this in survival, so this was fun. It was a challenge. I definitely fell a lot. As everyone who's seen my channel for a while knows, I have terrible aim and I'm very bad with the elytra. But yeah, here's what it looks like from the side. I tried to make sure we had a bunch of different levels going on, different mixtures in the textures of the different buildings, different roof sizes, just a lot of interesting, unique things to look at. I still don't know what I want to do with all of the different rooms yet, but let's take a quick peek inside. So first we do have a one block wide walkway through all of the towers. In here we have that entrance down into the tunnel, and I'm thinking I'm going to make the rest of this some sort of trophy room. That still exits out by the workshop, and that leads down into our storage room. Over here, it's a very open area, and I'm still really not sure what I want to do with it. Definitely thinking some decorations barrels, little workshop areas. I don't know what I want this room to be yet, but this is the bottom section of one of the towers. And I'm thinking back in here, since it is more enclosed and sectioned off, maybe some sort of living quarters. I know in my old castle I made the towers like the brewing and enchanting and nether portal, but we have those all separately, so I don't know if I'll be adding them into here or using this as more just big decorative ideas. In here I'm planning a fairly large workshop area that might be two stories. This I have no idea what I want to do with. Here we have another tower. In here, I was originally thinking some sort of, like, deep storage. When I first made this larger than the other towers, I was thinking, like, an open sort of patio situation, but now that it's enclosed, I'm not really sure what I want to do. I definitely need to add some windows to the tower sides themselves. And again, this isn't this isn't really a walkway, but you can walk across it.
I'm thinking I'm actually going to leave the scaffolding in the castle. It gives a sort of feel of it being under construction even once it's quote finished, which makes it feel more lived in and just adds a bit more story. For this room, I'm thinking either some sort of chapel situation or maybe like a lecture hall. It could also be like a huge player room. Back here, we'll do some sort of royal garden situation. And over here, I'm thinking a secondary marketplace with a bit fancier buildings and stalls. 